George Washington's exploits as both a politician and general are well known, but should he be equally recognized as a businessman? According to author Edward Lengel, the answer is an unqualified yes. In his new book, First Entrepreneur, How George Washington Built His and the Nation's Prosperity, Lengel makes the case that Washington's business acumen and economic outlook are just as important to understanding the man and the country he helped form. He was a big believer in individuals creating their own wealth and by virtue of their own hard work. He took those principles and he applied them to the country as a whole as president because he believed that Mount Vernon and what he did at Mount Vernon was a microcosm of what other entrepreneurs could do for America. Uh, let's get a sense then of what he did at Mount Vernon. What did he make? What did he sell? Well, he started out with tobacco. That was what uh, he had inherited from his ancestors. That's what he knew. Tobacco had a lot of different problems. The biggest problem was that in growing tobacco in the colonial era, he was forced to work within the British credit system. That fostered debt. And I can tell you that the one thing that Washington feared most of all was debt. So he switched over to wheat. And wheat accomplished a lot of things. It allowed him to buy and to sell on his own account, uh, to be his own entrepreneur, to be his own merchant. And it also allowed him, because wheat was much less labor intensive, to make his estate self-sufficient. And it became a, a huge sprawling industry in its own right. They spun and they wove to create their own clothing. Uh, they cobbled their own shoes. They created their own ironwork and tools. Uh, and of course they had a, a very successful fishery as well. Uh, those were just in the early days. Later on he did much more. Yeah, including the distillery. Including the distillery, which... We don't want to forget that. No, never. That was in the last uh, couple years of his life and, and it's interesting. He had never had any experience with that before, but his farm manager, a Scot named James Anderson, suggested that he try it. He studied it carefully and then he took a chance. It was very profitable. Uh, Washington was a slave owner. Uh, probably a good deal of work on his farm was done by people who were forced to work there. Yeah. Um, does that undercut Washington as a model entrepreneur? Well, Washington was great in many, many ways. And the truly great individuals transcend their times. In many ways, he did transcend his times. Slavery was one area where it took him some time to begin to understand the fundamental problems and the fundamental principles at issue. He didn't automatically react to it either as a great good or as a great evil, but he studied it. And what he latched onto initially was not a, a kind of a moral, a solely moral issue, but was based on the fundamental principle of the right to work freely and the right to enjoy the fruits of your labor freely and the right to invest and prosper freely. And Washington believed that industry and morality were two sides of the same coin. A moral man will be industrious. The industrious man is therefore a moral man. If you prevent a man from being industrious on his own account, you corrupt him morally, and you corrupt yourself morally, and it corrupts the nation, it enervates the nation. He began to see what this would do over the long term to his own estate, not just looking in the short term, free labor, but looking what would happen in the long term. Enslaved people will do the minimum possible. Naturally, they don't want to be enslaved. They want to be free. So they're going to do the very minimum that you tell them to do. They're not going to innovate. They're not going to experiment. They're not going to work hard because they want to. They're only going to do what they're told. And how are you going to grow over the long term that way? That was where he really saw the evil in slavery. Now what held him back from freeing his slaves earlier, I think, was because he was a, a law and order guy who feared social disruption and dislocation, and he was simply afraid of what would happen. But you have to give him credit that he did eventually, by the terms of his will, say that his slaves would be freed upon Martha's death. Uh, and of course, Martha didn't like that, so she freed them uh, herself earlier. You titled chapter three of your book, 
which deals with the American Revolution, the road to economic freedom. Is that how Washington and the nation saw the fight for independence? Yes, it absolutely was. He thought that economic freedom was the basic goal to free Americans from a system that prevented them from taking off. Americans in Washington in particular believed in the early 1770s that soon we would be able to produce for ourselves agriculturally, we'd be able to develop manufacture and industry, and the only thing that really prevented us from achieving that were British restrictions on, on American entrepreneurship. And so he believed that that, that was the, f the fundamental goal. He believed that initially that the war against Britain should be an economic, a trade war. Now certainly he eventually came to realize that this had to be a military conflict, but he initially hoped that it would be an economic conflict. And trade war through boycott. Through boycott. Why write this book? I mean, Washington lived 200 years ago, very different America, very different world. What, why is it relevant? Well, part of it is because it gives us a whole new window onto Washington and, and what made him tick. And to realize that he thought about money and he thought about the economy a lot. Not because, as we might think in the 21st century, oh, he was a greedy guy, but because he understood that, that money was the lifeblood of human society. You know, that, that it was just extremely important. The principles that Washington believed in in terms of personal entrepreneurship, in terms of national economic policy, work and industry are absolutely relevant today. And I think that by writing this book, I'm trying to set those before Americans to, to realize that these are basic principles that, that really we need to return to as much as we can. When people think about um, founding fathers and scientific experimentation, they usually think of Jefferson, uh, Franklin, do you believe Washington should also be put in that camp? Yes, but he should be put in that camp in terms of being a hands-on learner. He was an experiential learner. He, he, he wanted to be there in that tool shed tinkering and learning how to invent and experiment himself. So for example, if he would receive ideas from overseas about some new plow or some new threshing device or some new grist mill, he wanted to be there and put it together and learn how it worked himself. He, was, he had the mind of an engineer. He did believe in ideas, but, but he was the type of guy who wanted to be in the laboratory. Any new technology, you should study it, experiment with it, and then apply it. He also believed that it was essentially the role of um, the rich to underwrite these scientific experimentations and to innovate and to experiment and not the role of the government to push for specific industries or certain pathways. Oh, it was certainly not the role of the government. Uh, any form of subsidies, government subsidies, he rejected out of hand and Jefferson agreed with him on that. Uh, he wouldn't even consider it. He didn't think it was only the role of the rich. Uh, certainly the rich should, should invest the money, they should help set the example perform the large-scale experiments and that they should invest the bulk of the capital needed to develop new industries and new technologies, but he didn't think the burden should be on them alone. Uh, he really believed that the burden was a shared burden. That was one of the reasons he believed in education. If individual Americans would become well-educated, practically educated, he believed in practical education, then they would be able to read such things as Arthur Young's Annals of Agriculture, which was just an absolute wealth of knowledge uh, in that publication about agriculture, experimentation, and industry. They could share that, they could learn from it, they could share it, and they could enrich each other. He really believed that if you created a situation in which commerce could thrive, that people would see their collective interest in staying at peace, in, in working with each other peacefully. He thought that on the frontier, for example, that if Americans, if white Americans and Native Americans could trade with each other and they could enrich each other through that trade and through that commerce, that naturally they would want to remain at peace. He, saw th he thought the same thing internationally as well that the, the best guarantor
to preventing war between nations was to increase commerce. Now, he, he did talk about how he wished war could be banished from the face of the earth, but I, I don't think it was a utopian vision. It wasn't something that was based on dreams. It was something that was based on hard, solid facts.